Hey class, I'm Mr. Thornton, and I'm going to help you get that C in your GCSE. This lesson, Electrolysis. Part 2, Practical Examples and Applications. This topic was suggested by Shahid Hussain, Oliver Lennox, Ibtissam Adam, Ben Twenty Cog, and Maria Hunter. Thanks guys. If there's a topic you're having trouble with, then just leave a comment below. In part one of this lesson, which you can see if you click just here, or check the links in the description for this video, I explain the theory behind electrolysis. In this video, I'm going to assume that you understand that, and I'm going to look at some of the practical applications for how it works. Let's start with aluminium. Now, aluminium is a fairly common material today, but it used to be much more expensive. Adjusted for inflation, it used to be about 10 times as expensive as it currently is. It was quite a rare metal when it was used to build the statue of Eros in London's Piccadilly Circus. And so it was very expensive to construct that statue. And the reason it was so expensive is because there wasn't an easy way to extract it at the time. It's fairly common in the Earth's crust, but it's more reactive than carbon, which means that we can't extract it from aluminium oxide in the same way that we can extract iron from iron oxide or copper from copper oxide by heating them with carbon. With iron and copper, because they're less reactive than carbon when you heat them, or when you heat their oxides with carbon, you form carbon dioxide as the carbon steals the oxygen and you're left with the pure metal. With aluminium, because it's more reactive, this process doesn't work. And so the cost of aluminium was really astronomical compared to today's prices. Electrolysis allows us to produce aluminium far more cheaply. We produce aluminium from its ore, a mineral known as bauxite. Bauxite contains aluminium oxide, which is the raw material we really want. We could heat this up to melt it uh, and then electrolyze that liquid, but it's got a very high melting point. So what we use is a secondary mineral, something known as cryolite, and you do need to know the name of this mineral. Now cryolite melts at about 1000 degrees Celsius, which may seem like a very high temperature, but it's way lower than the melting point of aluminium oxide. So it's far more energy efficient to melt cryolite, and this cryolite will then dissolve the aluminium oxide out from the bauxite ore, and then we can electrolyze this liquid, the mixture of cryolite and aluminium oxide. The electrolysis works pretty much the same as any other electrolysis process. We insert two electrodes into our liquid and we apply an electrical current. The aluminium ions, because they're positively charged, move over towards the cathode. And you get pure aluminium forming at the cathode. At the anode, you get oxygen forming because you split up the aluminium from the oxide. Now the anode is normally made out of carbon carbon will conduct electricity, and the oxygen combines with the carbon to form carbon dioxide, so the waste product bubbles off as a gas. We can also use electrolysis to take an object made out of a comparatively cheap metal like steel and coat the surface of it in a thin layer of atoms of a more expensive metal such as copper or gold or chromium. Sometimes we do this just because it looks nicer, or sometimes there can be a real benefit into coating it in a surface which is made of less reactive atoms, for example in electrical connections which I'll come back to shortly. So for example, if you took a piece of steel and you made it the cathode in an electrolysis circuit and you dipped it into a solution of copper sulfate, the copper ions would move out of the solution and they'd coat the piece of steel. We can also use this to gold plate things. Uh, the electrical connectors in things like a SIM card or the headphones of your mobile phone may well be coated in a very thin layer of gold atoms. And it's electrolysis which has done this as well. It's steel beneath that layer, but there is an incredibly fine layer of gold atoms which has been placed there by electrolysis to give a better electrical connection because gold doesn't tarnish the way steel does. Your teacher may have shown you other examples of electrolysis. There are dozens of possible combinations and I can't possibly show you every single one, but the underlying principle is the same. So for example, if you've looked at lead bromide, lead, the metal, goes towards the cathode and coats it in a layer of lead atoms. And the bromide ions come out of solution and form bromine gas, which is a brown gas. It's quite toxic and poisonous. And so that's normally one which would be done in a fume cupboard. You may also have looked at lithium chloride. Again, lithium is the metal there, it's in group one. 
and the lithium will move towards the cathode and form lithium atoms and the chlorine, the chloride ions that is, will go towards the anode and form chlorine gas which again will bubble off. So it's the same sort of basic process every single time. There is one particular one which is a little more complex which you need to know about and that is sodium chloride, table salt again. So going back to the sodium chloride example, again sodium is the metal so that goes towards the cathode and chloride ions come out of solution and form chlorine gas and go towards the anode and they're given off as chlorine gas at the anode but that's where it gets a little bit more complex. Chances are your teacher's probably shown you what happens when you put pure sodium in water. Sodium is highly reactive, it's more reactive than hydrogen. So as soon as we form a sodium atom at the cathode, that sodium atom then reacts with a water molecule in the solution. It displaces one of the hydrogen atoms in that water molecule, forming sodium hydroxide, which is a strong alkali. And the hydrogen atom, which is displaced, joins onto another hydrogen atom, which is being displaced, and forms hydrogen gas. And so, in this example, whilst you might think that you were going to get chlorine given off at the anode and sodium produced at the cathode, actually what you get are bubbles forming at both the anode and the cathode. You get chlorine given off at the anode, and you get hydrogen given off at the cathode, and you start forming sodium hydroxide in the solution. Now this is actually quite useful. All three of these substances are really useful reagents or reactants within the chemical industry. We can use chlorine to form some plastics and it can also be used to make bleach. We can use sodium hydroxide to make things like soap. And the hydrogen can be used for a range of uses. It can be used as a fuel, it can be used to hydrogenate vegetable oils, but it's got a lot of uses. But you do need to be aware of this particular example. So sodium chloride, because sodium is reactive, the sodium immediately reacts with the water in the solution and you form sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas at the cathode where you were making the sodium. I hope that video really helps you. If you want to check how well you understood, then try the snap quiz. The link is right here and it'll also be in the description along with all the other links for this video. If you want to check out my other videos, then click right here. If you want to download the free app I've made to help you with your revision, then you can click right here. If you want to subscribe to my channel, then you can click right here. Don't forget to leave likes, and if you go to the comments, you can give me feedback and let me know which topics you'd like me to cover next. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.